question. Hi, thanks. Kelly Myman with McCarty Associates. Thanks for the panel. Um, you raised China, uh, Ambassador Holliman. How do you think that we should or should we at all address the matter of forced technology transfer as we're trying to push forward the digital trade agenda in all these various forums? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Look, I, I, you know, you know, I, would, I would not have put sanctions. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I would, I, sanctions are fine. I would not have put tariffs on US companies as a basis to try to force these issues with China, but given that that's the route that we are. Look, I think the, you know, what's happening between the US and China now around forced technology transfer, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's fundamental. Uh, and you know, now that we've taken the approach that we have, we have to get the right rules in place that are disciplines against those kind of forced technology transfers, whether they're explicit or implicit, that have been um, the norm in China. And I would say that the US at this point is the pointy end of the spear. And I would look at it back to our early intellectual property discussions with China, with Carla Hills and Mickey Kanner and Charlene Barshevsky, where, you know, in those days, China did not have a law that protected foreign IPR. You know, the US, by threatening sanctions and, that, you know, and, and tariffs, was able to secure protection first for U.S. IPR, and then the, he, the Europeans piggybacked on that to get protection for European IPR. And now I think at some levels, you know, China actually is quite supportive of IPR, it's just at their own time, own place. So I look at these efforts around forced technology transfers, is that the U.S. is pressing on this and using all the tools that the U.S. has. Again, you could debate whether those tools should have been used in that way. But quite frankly, whatever the US secures in this will be the best that any other nation will be able to secure from China. And this is, again, the sort of large trade distortive effect that these practices can have in, in China. Uh, where I think it's going to be hard, though, is on issues like data flows. Um, certainly, you know, my experience working with China is that anything that deals with control of information is sort of the third rail in Chinese politics where they're not going to do anything that deals with that. And therein lies, I think, the fundamental problem between our issues like cross-border data flows, how trade agreements emerge, is I think that the, there are such fundamental differences. And I hope the administration and USTR is able to make significant progress on that with China because I think ultimately, um, that we have to have a better level setting on that. Thanks, uh, Jean-François Guetta with uh, AFEP, which is a French business roundtable. Um, I have two questions, a broad one and a smaller one. Broad one is the environment, the views in this country about the internet have changed substantially over the past couple of years. Uh, about regulation, there are different views among uh, politicians, different views among states. There are different views among companies. I don't want to put uh, you these on the spot, but uh, obviously Mr. Cook and Mr. Zuckerberg don't share the same view. Uh, and I wonder whether this will have an impact or not on the position of the US in international negotiations. So that's my broader question. The second one is uh, the uh, EU, I think, uh, agreed a new set of rules on copyrights and uh, the internet yesterday. Uh, you might not have enough details about that, but I would love to hear your views on that. Thanks very much. Um, 
out, I will take the, the second question. Uh, and I'll just take that question as it relates to artificial intelligence. Um, and one of the, the comments that was made earlier on the panel is the importance of having uh, frameworks in place to allow uh, data analytics or machine learning to take place. Um, it's, it, uh, it is, uh, it's been a very busy year in that space, policy making around, policy making wise around the world. Uh, the United States has, has had and has benefited from a fair use framework that has allowed for uh, non-consumptive uses of data to be used in machine learning processes. Uh, but earlier this year in the summer, uh, Japan uh, issued an, an amendment to its copyright law that allowed similarly for th that type of, of uh, use of data, uh, thereby allowing uh, entities in Japan to conduct data analytics, which is very important. For, for artificial intelligence, and more recently in January last month, uh, Singapore announced that they would be instituting a similar exception. So we've been been uh, watching very closely uh, the discussions in the EU on a, on a similar exception and and uh, do favor that that type of exception being put in place. Um, I'll comment on uh, the views of the internet changing. Um, IBM strongly supports the Digital Trade Chapter in the USMCA. There, there was, however, one provision in there on intermediary liability that we didn't think was appropriate to include in a trade agreement. Um, we think that the policy around this is evolving, and so it didn't seem appropriate to kind of enshrine that in a trade agreement. Um, there may be more debate about this going forward. Uh, the fact that something that we didn't fully support is in the agreement does not mean that we're not going to support the agreement. We think USMCA is, is a great trade deal. Uh, we think that the digital trade chapter as a whole really does set the standard and we strongly support it. But you know, USTR has to deal with differences among companies all the time. So there's always compromise to be found in various places. Uh, but that was one particular issue that uh, you know we took a different view. And I'll, I'll answer the first your first question, um, which is no. I don't think that these debates that are playing out in the U.S. between companies and positions are likely to affect how the U.S. negotiates in trade agreements, except occasionally in the margin, because of course all trade agreements are a floor, they're not a ceiling. So many of these things could result in changes in U.S. law. But Congress has been very clear in granting the administration the trade negotiating authority that they need to have um, laws that are fundamentally compatible with the U.S. Um, and they shouldn't be creating new obligations on the U.S. that are inconsistent with existing U.S. law. So I don't think that this is likely to change the fundamental approach, which is we need privacy. We need cross-border data transfers. We need competition. We need to ensure more integrity and confidence of citizens. And then these you know, raging debates that are happening will play out both commercially, in terms of how people appeal to their customers and their clients, and they may play out domestically, but in the, you know, sort of in the near term, midterm, I don't think that's going to change how the US negotiates our agreements. And I'll just say, Apple has a very strong and, and public position on privacy, but for purposes of the trade conversation, I think trade agreements recognize the right to regulate, um, and that's really important to keep in mind, that none of this conversation is about taking away the right of privacy regulators to protect the, the data privacy of their citizens or any other regulators to do their job. And so you know, the conversation is really about how, you know, with that baseline, can we facilitate um, the sorts of data transfers that regulators you know, in Europe themselves uh, recognize you know, the conditions under which they can happen. Hi, thanks to the panel. Uh, Tim Rayo from the Center for National Private Enterprise. When it comes to um, the extraterritoriality and you know the thornier debates, whether it's Dragonfly or whatever, um, you know, Project Maven, the, the question, the really difficult questions we're struggling with, um, how do you reconcile the cross-border data flows and the extraterritoriality of data 
with the fact that we do have very different legal systems in different countries and that software is not actually law. Law is a covenant between humans. Um, and th this very huge gap between countries that protect civil liberties and those that don't. And, and you know, is there any, to the interesting of position on mutual legal assistance treaties and uh, whether it's Microsoft Ireland, things like that, because these are, I think, the, the, the heart of why this stuff is so difficult. Thanks. Thank you very much. That, that is a, a very good question, and it, it, it does go, so, so one of the questions that service providers um, face uh, when they're operating in different markets uh, is a challenge uh, where you may face a request for a data that's stored overseas on a server in, a, in another country, and uh, service providers can end up in a situation in which that if they comply with that request, it can violate the law or breach the law of the country in which the, the data is stored. And so I think you, you raise an important point that um, there, it, it, it is necessary to have a, a comity analysis, an analysis that helps uh, resolve potential conflicts of laws and allows for, for regulators to speak to each other um, or for a judge to look at those issues and, and, and determine uh, how to deal with the conflicts of laws in that type of scenario. The only thing I would add is obviously the US passed the Cloud Act um, in response to the Microsoft Island dispute. And I think it just underscores probably your point, which is that these are very complex issues. I, I, I don't know if the UK is off the rank or you know, I think I'm very close to doing a deal um, with the UK, it'd be a very similar system of, of law and, and values in many respects, um, how you expand that out will be, will be challenging. Uh, thank you. I'm Olivia Zhang with China's Taishi Media. So I want to, uh, in terms of China, I'm wondering, like, uh, because China, as you mentioned, uh, has different approach in terms of data as U.S. I wonder, will that be like uh, create another layer of tension on top of the structure issues as is going on with U.S. and China negotiations? And uh, secondly, uh, I would like to. Uh, Ask you to share your opinion on the Trump's executive order on promoting AI. Uh, will, can we see it as industry policy? Uh, wondering like how you think of that. Is that like something you would like to see more from the administration to promote AI, or uh, it seems like no funding is allocated now. Do you want to see more on that front, or do you think it's the administration should not do anything on that? Thank you. Um, the, the executive order on AI uh, and IBM would welcome that. We think it includes some important principles that we've been supporting, so we're glad to see the focus on it. Um, we would be glad if uh, Congress appropriates more money for it as well, uh, for fundamental research in this area. Uh, we do think it's an important area, um, and we are just glad to see that coming. To, to your first question, um, a, a, absolutely the tension between the U.S. and China around data and how data is used is not only part of the current negotiation, but it's, it's important long term. I mean, if the largest, the second largest economy with a population the size of China and the data is restricted within China, and Chinese companies can get that data and monetize that data and use that data, but no one other than Chinese companies can effectively do that. But Chinese companies then have access to data all around the rest of the world. It's clearly an unlevel playing field. And so you know, China needs to have approach, whereas if its companies can use and access and monetize data, uh, from within China on everything from industrial to health to others in whatever restrictions that China may put in place then it needs to be a level playing field for all companies who are doing business in China 
and the Chinese approach I think is, is different and it is clearly designed to favor Chinese companies at the expense of global companies, whether they're large or small. Good morning, Gabriella Beaumont-Smith with the Heritage Foundation. Um, we've talked a lot about GDPR today, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on the proposal by some of the member states about the digital tax. Tax is not my area, so I, I can't say much about it because I just don't know. But I, I do know that IBM's focused on the work in OECD on trying to find a broader solution uh, to digital uh, uh, taxes. And that's about the extent of my knowledge. But we're, we're glad that the OECD is looking at this and we're participating in that process. Without commenting specifically on a tax proposal, I think the framing of it is important because it's, I mean, I think it's a US government view, but I think it's the right view, which is it's not coherent to think about this tax issue, taxation issue simply as a digital issue, right? Because essentially what the issue is, is provision cross-border of a service. Um, and a lot of services are provided increasingly cross-border where the value might be generated in one country but essentially sold in another country. And I think that gets at sort of a lot of the concerns that not only the EU but other countries have. And so, you know, it's easy then to extrapolate out. I think these countries that are worried about that on the digital front are probably exporting themselves services where the value has been created tax domestically and not in the country where that export is going. So if you sort of ex sort of if you scale these ideas and actually apply them consistently across the board, I don't think we would realise that they make a lot of sense just focusing on the digital space. Irving Williamson, US International Trade Commission. I was wondering if you could touch more on the employment implications of what you've been talking about. Josh began to go there. But given how controversial trade, trade agreements have been and the employment impacts and the outsourcing, you know, the whole rhetoric, I'm trying to think, how do we avoid that happening in terms of digital trade? You talked a lot of, of I've been very impressed that everybody's talked about inclusivity in their policy formulation and other things that I think help avoid those problems. But uh, particularly about employment impacts and do we need to have safety nets, et cetera. Thank you. In IBM, we think education is, is the primary answer to this, and we've actually got a lot of programs that uh, IBM's chairman, Jenny Rometty, has been talking about. She talked about this in Davos, and she's been talking about it for quite a while. IBM, for years now, has had a program called P-TECH. It's Pathways in Technology. It, it's a four-year high school combined with a two-year associate's degree in a technology field. And what we've been trying to do through that is provide alternatives to the four-year college degree that uh, many people can't afford, or it may not provide the right skills, but by um, working with local school districts, and I think we're around 100 schools now around the world, roughly, in, in this, um, most of them in the US at this point, but we're going global, is to work uh, with other industry partners, work with the school districts and the local community colleges that can provide the training to make sure that the skills, that the classes they're getting are relevant to the workplace. Uh, a lot of times we find that um, people coming out, even a four-year degree, may not have the right skills, and it's not so much the degree, it's the skills that companies are looking for. Um, we've also, more recently, been instituting apprenticeships. So there's a lot more of this in Germany, for example, uh, but looking at apprenticeships in technology fields where, again, we can give an alternative pathway to a four-year college, which may not be the right thing for, for some people. And we've actually, um, when our chairman was at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, uh, right after the first of the year, she had, I think it was five IBMers up on stage where they're talking about the various paths that they had come through, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a firefighter or a uh, former teacher, whatever it was, came to IBM through different um, programs, different ways of getting training, but the, the skills that they brought from a different background were still applicable for our business. So um, there needs to be more of that kind of agile education, alternative education pathways so that people will be able to move quickly as new opportunities arise and not just get locked into whatever their current skill set is. Another thing I'd add, you know, 
like IBM, lots of companies are trying to think about what skilling looks like. You know, this isn't just a digitalization of trade, it's a digitalization of our society, and so this is increasingly relevant. Um, you know, we have Alcohol's program called Everyone Can Code, and that's about getting the technical skills um, out through all levels of education, but you know, we also have a program called Everyone Can Create, and really that's about thinking what digitalization means for all the other jobs that we have, and how you can sort of use the digital tools that are available um, to sort of, you know, develop, whether it's new jobs or put them to use in old jobs, and so not just thinking about things about getting the skilling on the digital tools themselves, but how to deploy those. Let me just add one point. I've been spending a lot of time working on digital health issues. Um, and this doesn't answer the employment question, but you know, I would posit that we would never be able to have universal health care, which is a UN goal that the US has supported. You could never have had universal health care prior to how you deal with digital tools around digital health. I mean, I think it is very much like the classic, you know, sort of, you know, evolution around landlines and moving to a mobile environment that allowed particularly emerging economies, but also people in the United States and elsewhere to leapfrog. And so I think if you look at both the economic impacts of health, improved health, I would argue and I feel strongly that it would not be possible to provide the kind of health care in this country or globally that our citizens are demanding pre the advent of digital technologies that will become essential tools that will allow this in affordable ways to be provided to others. So I think we have to, as we talk about potential displacement, and that's quite real because I think the U.S. has done a terrible job of how we deal with these, not because of trade, but just because of changes that are happening. But I think we also have to look at the fact that this digital is an enabler for people in all walks of life and all countries to have things as fundamental as improved health. I'll just jump in briefly. Um, and just picking up on the panelists' comments, I, I, you know, the. And an ambassador's point, I mean, in many respects, this is really about technology and less about trade. I mean, there will be trade and globalization um, elements to it. I mean, if you look at the Orphan Hansen, you know, very sort of pessimistic assessments about what the China shock did for the US of around 2 million job losses. It's 2 million out of 6 million in the decade between 2000 and 2010, which is still 30 odd percent, and the rest of it being essentially technology, and that will continue to be the case. Uh, I mean, you only have to go back to the 18th century when the Luddites, you know, broke machinery, uh, you know, in response to you know, the, re the replace of the industrialization going on in England at the time. And the franchise in England at that point was was, was highly constrained, right? I mean, women didn't vote, they had to own land. Um, and we have, you know, much broader franchise here. So you, it's easy to imagine as, you know, these new ways of technology start actually pushing out some of the more cherished areas that we protect in the professions. I mean, you know, lawyers, I'm a lawyer, so guilty as charged, have done well in protecting themselves through, you know, various licensing and other new requirements. And that's really true across the services sector. So, the, you know, the political economy of this is easy to imagine regulatory pushback as, you know, the, the white collar, more highly skilled jobs are potentially charged by these technologies. So getting, you know, getting in right, taking, seeing the advantages and having in place the policies and I think together it's going to be key. And I think the silver lining of this president is that people are now looking at that I think, seriously. I've got a lot of colleagues at Brookings who've done some great work and other, other than the town. I think are thinking about this more deeply than it's been done in a long time. Hi, good morning. My name is Clarice Brown from Eurasia Group. And I'd like to take a minute just to, to, number one, thank you so much for your time. And also on the matter of interoperability. It seems like that's a very good goal, but given the fragmentation of data privacy regimes ranging from India to China to the US and the EU, it seems increasingly unlikely. So my question for all of you is, if you had to put a probability on it or assess the likelihood of it, um, what would it be and what would your reasons for it be? And what are the implications for a bifurcated data privacy regime if that's not something that's achieved?